Sing with us. It's now time for the children's story. So if the kids want to come forward, we have a special night this week's for you.
glad to see everyone on this rainy Sabbath morning. There are a lot of you here this morning. And we've been singing a lot of fun Christmas songs this morning. Um, Christmas is right around the corner. So we have been decorating at our house. We've been singing Christmas songs. We've been listening to Christmas songs. How many of you have been listening to Christmas songs at your house? How many of you have been listening to Christmas songs for a long time already? Yeah, <laughs> we started early too, because we love them so much. What are some of your favorite Christmas songs? Does anybody have a favorite one that you like to sing? What's your favorite Christmas song? We Three Kings. We Three Kings. Oh yeah, we're gonna be talking about that this morning. Who else? What's one of your favorite Christmas songs? Jingle bells. We love jingle bells at our house. We also like songs like Deck the Halls because we love to sing Fa La 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 La. That's a fun one to sing. And we were listening to Christmas songs this week, and one came on that we started talking about. It's called The Little Drummer Boy. How many of you have ever heard this song about the little drummer boy? Do you know that story? Yeah. So this is not a Bible story, but this is a, a story and a song that we're going to talk about this morning, and it has a really special lesson for us this morning. We're going to start off with three kings, so I'm glad you talked about the song, We Three Kings. There were three wise men that came to worship Jesus, and this might have been what they looked like. They might have come with lots of people. They might have had lots of money. We're not sure, but they brought really expensive gifts to Jesus. And they might have been dressed really, really nice looking and really wealthy. So when they came into town, people took notice. And they were worshiping Jesus, and they brought expensive gifts for him because they wanted to worship him, and they loved him. Well, while they were worshiping Jesus, a little boy was walking by and thought, what is going on? I see lots of expensive gifts and maybe lots of people. And so he got closer and the wise men turned around and saw him walking by and they said, come, come and see the newborn king that we're worshiping. So he got a little bit closer and he looked and he saw Jesus. And he looked around and everybody was worshiping Jesus. And they had really nice expensive gifts. And he thought, wow, this must be a really special person to be born a king. He said, well, I think I would like to worship him too, but I'm poor. I don't have a lot of money. I don't have a lot of expensive things to give to Jesus, but he had something in his hand. Does anyone know what he had in his hand? A drum. You're exactly right. He had a drum. He said, well, I don't have anything to give to Jesus, have something that I could do for Jesus. I have a drum. He said, I wonder if I could play my drum for Jesus. I don't know if you can see in this picture, he's facing Jesus and he has a drum in his hand. And this might have been what it could have looked like. So he thought, he asked Mary, he said, shall I play for Jesus? Can I play my drum for him? And Mary nodded. And so he got closer to Jesus and he sat down and he took out his drum. And he took out his drumsticks, and everybody got quiet and listened. And he started to play, brum, 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 bum, bum. And the wise men listened, and Jesus was listening, Mary and Joseph were listening, and the song says that even the animals were nodding to the rhythm of the music that he was playing. He did his best for Jesus, and he was so happy that he could do something for Jesus. And you know what? The song says that at the very end of him playing his song, Jesus smiled. Did you know that Jesus loves gifts to him? He loves any kind of gifts. He loves gifts that we give that we can see and touch, and he loves gifts of things that we can do for him. He loves simple gifts. He loves expensive gifts. If they are gifts given with joy in our heart and given to worship him, did you know there were people here this morning that were doing things to worship him? Did you know there was a worship team up here playing for Jesus? Did you know that when you came in this morning, there were people at the front door worshiping Jesus by welcoming you as you came in the door? Because that's a gift that God has given them to do. What are some things that you could think of 
maybe that you could do to worship Jesus? Can anybody think of anything? It doesn't have to be in the church. It could be at your home. What if you like to clean and organize at your home? Is that something that you like to do? Yeah? Maybe you can go home and help out at home and clean and organize. Someone's shaking their head no. That is not everybody's favorite thing to do. Maybe you do like music and you can play music for Jesus. What's something you could do? You unload the dishes. And if you're doing that with worship in your heart, that is a great gift for Jesus. You're exactly right. Oh, that's even better. You like doing it. <laughs> well, good. Well, some of you might be really good at coloring pictures or writing cards to people. And did you know if you do that for people as, a, as worship, that Jesus is very pleased with that gift? It doesn't have to be something big. It can be something simple. So if you hear this song, come on, or you sing it at home, think about this week as you go home, something that you could do, even if it's just really, really simple, as a gift of worship to Jesus. All right, so let's go ahead and pray. Dear Jesus, we thank you so much for the gift of you this Christmas season that we get to celebrate you. Um, please help us as we go throughout our week. Give us ideas of things that we can do, even if they're very simple, as a gift of worship to you. Thank you so much for this beautiful Sabbath morning. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Probably missing the year-round golfing because of the weather over there. He's made good friends, and Bob Overstreet is one of his good friends. And so we're thankful to be here. We're here also with our youngest. We have five children that we share together, and uh, Shania is right here. And so we're just thankful to be here today. As a professor at Southern, we are at week 15, going into finals next week. And so my week has been very busy. Grading, projects. Students negotiating because they have late work. You know, just lots of meetings to wrap up uh, this semester. How was your week? Did you guys have a good week? Pretty good week? Did some of you have a very tough week? Like you're just happy the week. Oh, she raised her hand. You have a tough week, honey. <laughs> I love the kids here. <laughs> tough week? Well, if your week was a tough one or it was a great productive one, I pray that the worship today is meaningful to you. I prayed a long time for this message, and I, I'm praying that the words are relevant, they're meaningful, and that as we worship together, you're inspired and motivated for the week ahead. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, may the words spoken this morning be so relevant to each one that as the seeds are planted in each one's heart, Lord, the Holy Spirit will continue to water those seeds because we worship you. We want to have a great week ahead. Thank you for filling this gymnasium with your presence. We know the Holy Spirit is here with us, and our angels are too. Holy, holy, holy. Amen. Many things in life are uncertain, but there is one thing that remains the same. Change. You will always experience change. I will always experience change. There's an oxymoron, I'm sure you've heard, there is constant change. Children change at such rapid rates. We parents tend to wonder, what happened? It's almost like overnight, our children metamorphosize from these cute little huggers 
to these taller, bigger, leave me aloneers. Youth experience change so quickly. It's no wonder that a lot of them nowadays are going through frustration, anxiety, and all these other mental health issues. Transitioning into college, I see some of my college students here. Hey, <laughs> thank you for coming. Transitioning into college is perhaps one of the most challenging life changes a young person experiences. They have more independent decisions to make, and parent participation significantly reduces that the college student <laughs> now relies on their own self-management to complete their courses. Dr. Nancy Schlossberg developed the transition theory. She's an author, motivator, and she's a life transition specialist. She's written books such as Overwhelmed, Coping with Life's Ups and Downs, Retire Smart, Retire Happy, Finding Your True Path, and Getting the Most Out of College. Now, she defines a life change transition as any event or non-event that results in changed relationships, assumptions, routines, and roles. Some of you may have experienced a change in roles, perhaps a significantly new role, when you got married. When you realize that your world is no longer your own world, but you're actually sharing it with someone else, wh which is wonderful, babe. It's wonderful to share your life with other people, but sometimes, you know, you want to make your own decisions, but you can't because your spouse, your spouse is incorporated in all your decisions. And just like Amos records in the Bible, two must agree to walk together, right? So we're thankful for our spouses. Some of you changed roles, maybe in experiencing divorce or the divorce of your parents. That can turn your world upside down. Some of you had your lives changed when you had children and then when your children left home to be on their own. Many of you have changed homes, jobs, coworkers, change in management, leadership, church leadership, church membership, change in economics, politics, and sports championships. Change is inevitable, and change is hard. Some changes are desired and answered prayers. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. And some of them are detestable and the complete opposite of what you prayed for. Psychotherapist and author Richard Jolson says regarding life change, since your future may now be filled with questions, it is normal to feel afraid. We live in a culture that has taught us to be uncomfortable with uncertainty, so we are anxious when our lives are disrupted. Change is inevitable. Change is hard. A teenage girl living her life as she did in her day. Her life is simple. She is accustomed to the family traditions, and so this young girl helps at home. She makes dinner for her family. She cleans her room. But on her free time, she goes into the village and she talks to her friends, and they talk about the latest news. <gasps> Who just got engaged? She is to be a wife and is anticipating a major change in her young life. Mary's life change changed the world forever. She was chosen for change. Mary was given the assignment to birth and to care for Jesus. She was Jesus' mom. I wonder if Mary carried out the typical duties and responsibilities like we moms did. I imagine that Mary cooked and fed Jesus but I, I wonder if she had to make him eat his veggies or finish all his food off his plate or bless the food. <laughs> I just I wonder about those things. Um, I, I imagine Mary comforting Jesus when kids were mean to him or when he fell and scraped his knees. I think she did that. I imagine Mary disciplined Jesus. She set boundaries around him to keep him safe, except for when he was 12 years old and went missing for three days. After those three days, Mary found him in the temple. And the Bible records Mary saying, Son, 
Why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been looking for you anxiously. That's the second question Mary is known and recorded in the Bible to have asked. The first question Mary asks in the Bible is found in Luke chapter 1, verse 34. And if you have your Bible apps with you or your tangible Bibles, <laughs> old-fashioned ones, come on and open them. And we're going to look at Luke chapter 1, verse 34. Luke chapter 1, verse 34. And Mary asked this. This is the question. How shall this be? Since I have no husband, many of us are very familiar with this dialogue that Mary had with the angel Gabriel after Gabriel just told her that she is going to have a baby. And it comes naturally, that question, how will this be since I have no husband? This prompted angel Gabriel to then go ahead and explain the process. So in verse 35, the Bible records that the angel responded to her and said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. Now, I'm impressed by Gabriel Angel because he doesn't just give the steps one and two and stops there. But he continues on because he wants to affirm Mary. And he gives her an example of what God can do. The next verse says, And behold, your kinswoman Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. For with God, nothing will be impossible. I love that last verse that comes from the mouth of an angel, from someone who really knows God. And he says, with God, nothing is impossible. So G angel Gabriel tells Mary, he answers her question and says, well, this is what's going to happen. You're going to be blessed. You're going to have a holy child. And he doesn't just walk away. He inspires her and says, because you have a God that can do anything. And in fact, he already has your cousin all lined up in this ministry. She's already six months with child. Mary asked a good question. According to the Right Question Institute, yeah, do you know that existed? Look it up. The Right Question Institute, questioning is the ability to organize our thinking around what we don't know. Mary had a lack of understanding. And so the angel Gabriel provided her what she needed to organize her thinking. Thank you, Gabriel. In his response to Mary, angel Gabriel was patient. He was encouraging, motivating, and inspiring. So clear is angel Gabriel that Mary responds with, I'll accept. However, angel Gabriel wasn't as patient six months prior to this dialogue with Mary. Do you guys know where Angel Gabriel went six months prior? He went to talk to priest Zechariah. Zechariah is Mary's cousin-in-law. And so six months ago, prior to this conversation with Mary, Gabriel goes to Zechariah, and Zechariah is the priest, and it was his job to burn the incense at the altar of incense. And so Zechariah goes into the temple, and he burns the incense, and behold, Angel Gabriel comes and talks to Zechariah and tell Zechariah, you're going to have a baby. Your wife's going to bear a child, and your child has a special role, and the Messiah is coming. And Zechariah, just like Mary, asked questions. You know, as teachers, do we have any teachers here? We have teachers. You know, sometimes these questions can be really cute, and then after a while, you're like, okay, <laughs> ask three before me. <laughs> just done. So Angel Gabriel, he's like, can't I just send a message? People are just asking me questions all the time. Lord, and God probably said, Gabriel, you're so good at it. So Zechariah asked Gabriel, you know, this is the question that Zechariah asked. And uh, you can find this exchange in Luke chapter 1, verses 1 through 20. And Zechariah responds to Gabriel after Gabriel told him you're going to have a son. How shall I know this? For I'm an old man, and my wife is advanced in years. Well, this priest who was on duty, mind you, is made mute. Angel Gabriel delivered news to Mary, and Mary asked, how shall this be since I have no husband? Angel Gabriel asked, how shall I know this? For I'm an old man, and my wife is advanced in years. So why did Zechariah get in trouble? After asking his question, he gets a timeout. But when Mary asked a question, Gabriel 
gave her the process, inspired, he motivated her, gave her one of those gold stars. What a good question. <laughs> there you go. Right? We've all heard the saying, there aren't any dumb questions. Well, I'll tell that to Angel Gabriel. Because Gabriel says, because you did not believe my words. Zechariah's question communicated doubt. A doubting priest. Yikes. A priest who interceded for the people of Israel, whose job description was to mediate between the people of Israel and their worship to God. What was Zechariah missing in his understanding of God's work and ability that he would doubt the angel Gabriel? A Middle East Indian blog that focuses on English language usage posted a topic recently analyzing the use of the Indian word for question. The Indian word for question is used interchangeably for the word doubt. This isn't uncommon in other languages because in Spain, the word duda can also be used for question. Yo tengo una duda, I have a question. Or yo tengo una duda, I doubt. So the blogger clarified this by saying, in current American English, doubt could be considered to be a synonym of question, but the difference is that doubt implies lack of belief rather than lack of knowledge. Mary's question presented a lack of knowledge, and in return, Angel Gabriel explained the process of the upcoming miracle. While priest Zechariah, on the other hand, proposed a question of doubt and was given a timeout. Priest Zechariah should have known better. Had he forgotten his ancestors? Do you guys remember his ancestors, Abraham and Sarah? Well, they birthed a child in their old age. So Mary asked a question for guidance, not in doubt. Mary knew times were going to be difficult, but she saw the big picture. She saw the acrylic painting of her life and placed God's purpose as the canvas of her painting. She asked not because of her disbelief, but for the process and next steps that she needs to take. Mary knew God was in control. She knew that he is the artist of her bigger picture. And Mary believed in the bigger picture, in the end game, in the purpose. She didn't let the minor details of her upcoming life change dissuade her from accepting her ministry to come. Change is inevitable. Change is hard. Mary asked for understanding. She was chosen for change. Luke chapter 1, verse 38, Mary's words here record not a question, but this time she makes a statement. In Luke 1, 38, she says, Behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord. Let it be according to your word. This is a declarative sentence versus her first interrogative sentence. I was an English teacher as I started my field of education, so it's no wonder that I found these connections. And you'll find as we discuss what she said in the, in the Bible that we'll have an interrogative sentence, a declarative, um, we'll have an exclamatory and an imperative. So for those English buffs, that's just a little side note. But let's get back to the sermon. Okay, um, so <laughs> Mary declares and affirms Gabriel. She says, I am the handmaid of the Lord. She knows who she is. Mark Twain, famous American author, wrote, the two most important days in your life are the day you are born and the day you find out why. Mary knew exactly who she was and the role that she played on this planet. And so when presented with the assignment of birthing the upcoming savior, she accepts. She knew who she was. Now, did Mary know the details required to carry out her assignment? I don't know. But I suspect her confidence came from knowing whom she served. Change is inevitable. Change is hard. Mary knew who she was. She knew she was God's servant. She was chosen for change. Luke chapter 1, verses 46 to 56. This is now recorded the longest passage, the longest monologue from Mary. Mary's words have been short up until here, but we are given 
several lines of what Mary said when she met with her pregnant cousin Elizabeth. This is also known as Mary's song or Mary's Magnificat. And she says, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has regarded the low estate of his handmaiden. For behold, henceforth all generations will call me blessed, for he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is on those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He has put down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of low degree. He has filled the hungry with good times and the rich he has sent empty away. But he has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his posterity forever. Mary praised God. Mary didn't think about, oh, I've seen those pregnant women. Pregnancy is hard. She didn't think about that. She didn't think about, oh, I'm not even married yet. What's the society? What's the community? What are my friends going to think? She didn't think about that. She praised God for the ministry she's, she gets to be a part of. Psychotherapist, motivational speaker, and author of New York Times bestseller, Don't Sweat the Small Stuff. Has anybody read that book? Tammy has, of course. Tammy's read all the motivational books. Don't Sweat the Small Stuff. And um, I read this book a long time ago. I just didn't realize it had a subtitle. So Don't Sweat the Small Stuff. And it's all small stuff. Richard Carlson wrote in the chapter, Be Aware of the Snowball Effect of Your Thinking. And he says this, A powerful technique for becoming more peaceful is to be aware of how quickly your negative and insecure thinking can spiral out of control. Don't raise your hand, but has your negative thinking ever spiraled out of control? Sometimes you can work yourself so up you can actually vomit. I've never done that, but I know people who have. <laughs> I have worked myself up where I've hyperventilated, and so it can come from your mental faculties to now your physical, right? So he's right when he says that, that we can definitely work ourselves up right notice how uptight you feel when you're caught up in your thinking and to top it off the more absorbed you get in the details of whatever is upsetting you the worse you feel one thought leads to another and yet another until at some point you become incredibly agitated he gives an example for example you wake up in the middle of the night and remember a phone call that needs to be made the following day then Rather than feeling relieved that you remembered such an important call, you start thinking about everything else you have to do tomorrow. You start rehearsing a probable conversation with your boss, getting yourself even more upset. Pretty soon, you think to yourself, I can't believe how busy I am. I must make 50 phone calls a day. Whose life is this anyway? And on and on it goes until you're feeling sorry for yourself. Richard, Com, uh, the author continues in saying, it's impossible to feel peaceful with your head full of concerns and annoyances. The solution is to notice what's happening in your head before your thoughts have a chance to build any momentum. The sooner you catch yourself in the act of building your mental snowball, the easier it is to stop. Mary invested her energy in praising and in re rejoicing God rather than sweating the small stuff. Mary had the option to build mental snowballs, but instead she built a heart of praise. Change is inevitable. Change is hard. Mary praised. She was chosen for change. Moving forward now from the book of Luke to John, John chapter 2. John chapter 2 verses 1 to 11 records the wedding at Cana. And here we're going to take a look at just one more thing Mary said. And this time it's an imperative sentence. Again, for those that are interested. <laughs> this is an imperative sentence. So Mary says here at the wedding, and hopefully most of us are, are familiar. If not, Mary and Jesus, they're at a wedding, the wedding reception, and wine was a big thing. I'm not a theologian, so I don't know the significance of all of that, but 
and if the wine was fermented. I don't know. I just know that wine was a thing, okay, in those days. And so they ran out of wine. So Mary comes back to Jesus, and she tells her son, they have no wine. Jesus gives her his spiel. She goes back to the people and says, do whatever he says. <laughs> Here in this imperative, Mary takes charge. Mary's a little bit older now because Jesus is about 30 years old. She's had experience raising him. She's not asking any more questions, huh? She didn't go to him and, she, well, she didn't go to the wine and say, there isn't any wine. She didn't come back to Jesus and said, how can this be for there is no wine? <laughs> she didn't. She didn't ask more questions. She said, they have no wine. She went back to the people, do what he says. Empowered. Mary takes charge. She recognizes a need and calls on Jesus. She recognizes a problem and looks for a solution through Jesus. Mary here in her older age is cognizant of the needs of the community. She mediates for the people who lack wine. She served as a bridge mediating between the people and Jesus. In identifying a need for the community and talking to Jesus about it, coming back from Jesus to the people, Mary is the very first intercessor. I'm not sure why Mary wanted to make a difference at this wedding, but it's obvious that Mary knew something about Jesus that nobody else at the party did. In her knowledge about him and in her rela relationship with him, when prompted with a problem, Mary came to Jesus. Jesus invites us to seek him with all our hearts, our souls, and our minds. He invites us to come to him when we are burdened and heavy laden, and he will give us rest. Many of you will find yourselves in a setting, in a community setting, where the, you're the only one that knows Jesus. You're the only one that's had a life change and experience with Jesus. And you might know something about Jesus that nobody else around you knows. It's time to mediate. Change is inevitable, and change is hard. Mary came to Jesus, and Mary made a difference. Perhaps you have a testimony of life change, or you're in one now. Imagine if, like Mary, you asked God for the next steps. What amazing things would God do for you? Or what if you affirmed who you are every single day, and you said, I am the Lord's servant. I am put on this planet to dot, dot, dot. You fill in the blank. Mine is to raise children, take care of my husband, and mentor others. What's yours? Imagine what doors God would open for you if every single day you decided not to sweat the small stuff and instead rejoice and praise him. I wonder if you could, as a result of the changes in your life, develop a desire to mediate between the community and Jesus or between your family and Jesus, between your students and Jesus, your teachers and Jesus, your neighbor and Jesus. So my friends, during this Christmas season, when we typically think of Mary with child on a donkey or kneeling by a manger, let's remember that she is more than that. Mary exemplified a favorable response to change. Change is inevitable. Change is hard. You all were chosen for change. I'm always a big fan of a message that invites us to look inside and figure out what we can be doing better.
Lord God, now as we've come to the end of our worship service, we are not yet done worshiping you. As we leave from this place, Lord, we accept any changes in our lives that you find fit that we may mediate between the community and Jesus. As we move forward, Lord, give us a great week. Give us opportunities to minister to others. Thank you for the life changes. May we find you in every single detail of our lives. Now, brothers and sisters, may the God of love, hope, be yours now and forever. Amen. Uh, just a few announcements before we uh, depart. Um, if you take a look at the, uh, the bulletin, there's many, many things happening, but I just want to highlight a few um, related to Connect. First off, I see the, uh, the red box in the back is starting to fill up. It'll be here one more week. That's the coat drive. So uh, there's uh, a great need for that in our local community. So um, thank you for all who have donated. And one more week, uh, if you have time to, or if you're willing to uh, donate some of your lightly used coats. Uh, also tonight, our social committee has a, a great event planned. We have um, many things happening tonight. Is, uh, so the gingerbread house party is today. It's at... 6 p.m. Is that right? 6 p.m. at the Go Forth Room. Uh, they're going to build gingerbread houses, pizza um, for dinner. So please join. And then after that, since you're so close, there's a 6th, uh, 7th, and 8th grade boys have a basketball tournament at the high school, middle school. You can go from the making gingerbread houses to uh, the, the boys' basketball tournament. I think it's just boys, right? Oh, girls. I apologize. Yeah. So girl, boys and girls. My apologies.